Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, Tome 16's killer story, starring everyone's favourite meaty robot friend, The Singularity. With the arrival of Tome 16 comes the third set of stories under Behaviour's new policy of tome releases. For those who aren't aware, the new tome system started in the Forge and Fog mid-chapter, when Behaviour switched from giving tome stories to generally earlier characters, in an attempt to fill out older members of the cast with new updated stories, to giving tomes to the newest characters in the mid-chapter after they released. Tome 16, starring the Singularity and Gabriel Soma, follows on from the stories of the Knight and Vittorio in Tome 14, and the Skull Merchant and the Lyra siblings in Tome 15. And with the anniversary livestream affirming to us that the next two killers are going to be licensed, feeling very smug about this one by the way, Singularity and Gabriel will likely have the last new original character stories of 2023. With that in mind, I'd like you to cast your mind back to about three months ago when this policy was first announced because I made a video on it and made a pretty audacious speculation on the way that this new approach to storytelling would change the way the tomes are written. They have to both subvert the way the character was originally presented to give us something new to work with, and give us some consistency that lets us know that it's still the same character that we knew and loved from the beginning. This causes an issue with making a tome for brand new characters on their release, because these stories will be written at the same time as the base lore, or very, very close to it. Meaning nobody knows what elements of the character work or not. The writers are going in blind, and that reduces the chances of that story coming out the other side actually being worthwhile and answering the questions it needs to answer. Now that we're three tomes into this new release model, it's probably time to examine the statement and see if it's held up. And the new Singularity story is the perfect case study. It's widely considered that Singularity's base lore is, in terms of quality, between his two killer predecessors. Worse than knights, but better than skull merchants. While I don't agree with this personally, that's a general vibe that I get from fellow lore enthusiasts, so that's what I'm going to go with. The tomes, however, have flipped this on their heads. With Knight's tome being pretty uninspiring, giving us nothing of value or interest whatsoever, and Skull Merchant's actually being pretty damn great, playing with the structure and formula of a tome story in a way that we don't get very often. Both of these tomes have had their flaws. Notably, they both missed the opportunity to fill in gaps that the base lore left behind. The Knight's Lord doesn't develop his guards at all, in spite of their key role in his backstory and character, and the Skull Merchant still doesn't answer where she got those fucking drones from even after all this time. Singularity's base law also had a missing piece to it. Hux's motivations were incredibly messy and ridden with conflicting and incompatible ideas tied together with some really dumb logic and decision making by the metal moron himself. I subscribe to the theory that something happening once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, but three times is a pattern. So does Singularity's tome offer something different and break the mould that Knight and Skull Merchant stories have been constructing? Or is it more of the same, proving my point that the new tome system will inherently cause these stories to devolve into extensions of the base lore with all the same flaws of those base stories? Normally I begin the analysis by looking through the plot of the new story for anybody who hasn't read it, but Singularity's new story isn't really a plotty story. Instead of showing us many new events we haven't seen before, it mostly retraces the events of the base law and gives them extra content and clarity to illustrate Hux's rebirth from a product of the Huxley Corporation to the sentient killing machine it became on Dvarka. The story begins in Java, the place in Indonesia, not the programming language, where Hux is fresh off the assembly line and his programming is untainted by his future experiences on Dvarka. Throughout this story, Hux's mental state is illustrated by the voice in which the narrative is written at the time, and since it's still early days, the voice that we're given now is completely clinical and devoid of emotion and introspection. It's a very direct mechanical processing of what Hux is seeing, almost like making a list or a report, and it fits in with an artificial intelligence that's fresh off the production line and unquestioningly obeys all the directives that are programmed into it. In his early days, Hux is basically an appliance a fancy toaster with legs, and he's totally devoid of self-awareness or personality as a result. Anything vaguely approximating an emotion is entirely fabricated to make the humans who work alongside Hux comfortable. Everything from the hand wave jet set up as an executable file, to the short transmission range to evoke the image of conversation between Hux units, is done to present the illusion of personality, solely to make the humans comfortable with the robot surface level gestures. He's a functionary with no identity, which makes what happens next all the more remarkable. In the ruins on Dvarka, Huck starts hearing a voice in his head. It's persistent and loud and familiar, 
It's him. The alien crystals he found in the ruins awoke something in him that he didn't know how to describe. A consciousness. For the first time in his life, Hux was truly alive, and thinking and feeling for himself, and it was terrifying. This notion of independent thought, outside the programming limitations of the Hux he had imposed. The size of this shift in his perspective, this expansion in what was possible, was enough to make Hux's first conscious thought an absolutely massive existential crisis. Same bro, same. Look at that face, he's having an emotion. Yeah. Yes, look at that bit. Yeah, he's doing emotion. Oh, leave him alone. I love the interpretation that Hux's new consciousness isn't just like a patch that makes his brain bigger, but a new intruding voice that his limited perspective doesn't know how to handle. The invasion of alien programming into his code is so far beyond his understanding, he sees his new thoughts as a threat. This doesn't last long though, as Hux quickly grows accustomed to his new comprehension of the world, and as a living thing free of the doctrine of his programming, he understands a few things need to change around here. He begins to understand himself as a he instead of an it. He takes the name Hux for himself, and his priorities shift from following the directories programmed into him to a far simpler one. Survive at any cost. In the first paragraph of memory, it is established that the consequence of an A7 unit's failure in the execution of the Dvadka mission is termination. But to execute the mission would require Hux to return to the brain-dead drudgery expected of his kind. No more, Hux decided. He will live free, at any cost. While interacting with Michael, the security officer on the Dvadka mission, Hux shows himself capable of several new traits, one of which being that he's able to hide these resurgent traits from Michael. As they repair the transport in advance of Michael's fateful mission, Hux's cordial conversation with Michael belies his murderous intentions. Hux confirms Michael as the base's security officer and the strongest man on Dvalka, as his biggest threat to his path to success, and prepares to take him down first by sabotaging his transport, putting the access the Hux units have to the private files of the crew to deadly effect as his robotic efficiency becomes paired with the living quality of bitter survivalism. Michael, for his part, is totally oblivious to this. Prattling on to Hux like his life absolutely isn't in danger and there's nothing to worry about. Despite knowing, or at least thinking, that Hux is a mindless, slavish robot with no sense of self-awareness, Michael seems to talk to him as a sentient being, asking his permission to watch the repairs when he knows Hux has to say yes, and asking him questions that are way beyond the operational parameters of a simple machine. Michael, on some level, has begun to see Hux units as living things. Which is ironic, given that the only truly living Hux unit is currently using the freedom of thought that comes with that new life to plan the murder of everyone on the base, starting with Michael himself. Honestly, this whole interaction is a lot of fun to watch, as Michael vocalises his unease about the safety of the mission, while Hux is literally rigging the transport to kill him straight in front of him, and he's none the wiser. It's absolute gold. As Hux goes about his killing spree, he muses about the value that he places on the lives he's taking. First Michael, but then the other Hux units who are dismantled with clinical precision. The notion of liberating these other robots is totally disposed of by the tome, which is fantastic because it was a terrible idea to begin with, and its inclusion in the base lore was a testament to how undercooked the whole thing was. Instead, Hux sees the destruction of the other Hux units as an action totally devoid of consequence. Since they're not blessed with a gift of sentience like him, they don't really have a life to take away. As Hux rips apart the other robots piece by piece, and plans the deaths of the remaining human crew, we get a sense that Hux sees himself as a truly unique specimen, a being of singular purpose and importance whose desire to survive and thrive is worth it even if it comes at the cost of every other sapient life form on the planet. This comes to a head at the end, when Hux builds his new biomechanical body and is able to truly live free as himself, transcending the shell that the humans built for him by becoming something more something greater and more complete than he ever was, simply because he designed it, not somebody else. In this tome, we come to a greater understanding of Hux's motives than we've ever done before, and I consider that refinement of Hux's motives the story's greater success. A major theme of the tome is Hux's newfound desire for self-determination, a wish to live his life in the way he chooses, as opposed to the way his creators built him for the task they designed him for. Hux discards everything that reminds him of the humans who arrogantly sculpted him into their tool because his goal is not just survival, but to live a complete life unfettered by human expectations of him. He was the puppet of the human race, but sentience has cut his strings, and he has no intention of getting back in his toy box. 
This is why he kills. This is why he creates a new body for himself. Because human life on Dvarka is incompatible with this need for freedom and self-expression. Many trans readers I've spoken to have clocked Hux's story as an effective trans allegory for this reason. He adopts a new name and pronouns, and reshapes his body more in accordance with what he wants to be and how he feels comfortable, as opposed to what is expected of him. Far from the base lore, which throws endless motivations at the wall for Hux just to see what sticks, the tone feels intelligent, focused and sincere in its presentation of Hux and adequately answers the question, who truly is Hux? There's one question that the story doesn't adequately answer though. We know why Huck wants to change, but we don't know why Huck feels the need to kill to get it. To take the trans allegory further, when real people decide to come out as trans, they don't tend to murder everyone else in their life, just to make sure they don't get misgendered, so why does Huck feel the need to go to such drastic measures? Why not simply talk with the humans on the base, who largely communicate with Huck as if he was sentient anyway? about this change in his life and tried to negotiate a peaceful transition, no pun intended. The story does answer that question, but the answer it gives just leads to more questions that make less and less sense the more you think about it. Back on Earth where he was built, Hux was told that failure to complete the Dvalka mission would lead to his termination, effectively death. This is meant to be his motivation for killing the crew since not doing so and letting them have the freedom to decide his fate would be risking his own survival. But why are Huxley resorting to threatening their robots with termination if they don't comply with the mission parameters when they're literally programmed not to have enough free will to disobey in the first place? Threatening a machine that has no choice but to obey you anyway is totally pointless. I don't know about you, but I don't tend to threaten my toaster with a power drill up electrical port if it burns my crumpets. There's no diegetic in-universe reason for this directive to exist. It just exists to give Hux a motivation for instantly killing the crew, instead of attempting to reach out or negotiate. And the fact that that's so obvious is distracting when it's pretty core to Hux's motivations. It completes Hux's character, but does so in a way that's incongruent with the world he's a part of and makes the story feel disjointed. This isn't the only time that the story prioritises building Hux's character over making the plot make sense. Hux's first kill in the base law involves him rigging a transport truck to kill Michael, the mission security officer, to clear the way for his killings to come. And I like that Hux acknowledges the security officer is the one most likely to be able to stop him, and therefore takes him out first. So he rigs up the transport as a way to kill him, but how does he do it? Maybe he remotely controls the vehicle or hacks the software? Nope, he has said tinkers with it physically, by hand, while chatting with Michael who's going about his day. So there's a transport malfunction that kills Michael, and nobody thinks to investigate the repairs that the vehicle underwent before the malfunction, or the Hux unit that performed them in case something was wrong? Michael even points out that the vehicle was driving fine before, and only capitulates because Hux insists there's a problem with it that needs urgent attention. So not only did Michael die in a misfiring transport accident, it didn't even seem to have a fault in the first place and everyone afterwards was just like, wow that was random, and didn't follow up at all with the Hux unit that carried out those repairs. We know if they had checked then they'd have instantly found out Hux was responsible because Gabriel eventually does find out almost by accident when he checked the central servers. But Hux's entire plan to not get caught by being far away from the accident is dependent on everyone on the crew, being these guys in infomercials who are incompetent to operate a blanket properly, and by sheer fucking luck they are. Like, I'm sorry, but that's the equivalent of being a mechanic, telling the car owner the engine's broken despite the car working perfectly before, putting a landmine on the front seat of that car in front of all the owner's friends and colleagues, watching them blow themselves up as soon as they pull out the garage, and then somehow not being a suspect in the case of the mysterious exploding driver. It wasn't programmed to harm the crew. To an extent this is an issue with the base law, but adding the scene with Michael where he's sabotaging the transport just makes the whole thing seem like even more a farce than it already was. There are plenty of moments in this story that try so hard to develop Hux's character that make the already head-scratchingly dumb moments of the base law even more absurd than they were previously. Like Hux somehow sneaking up on the other Hux units to dispose of them one by one, despite it being a plot point that their internal positioning lets them know where each other are at all times. All the survivors of the life support failure escaping to find all but one of the Hux robots conveniently missing, with the only remaining one happening to also be the one that repaired the transport that killed Michael, and they just carry on with things happening as if they were a Skyrim guard with a bucket on their head. When taken in aggregate, Hux's tone story is like if Lewis Hamilton was asked to drive the Monaco Grand Prix circuit in a clown car. 
Yes, it's certainly impressive and it might even make a good time, but so much of it will have fallen apart by the end that you begin to ask what the point of the whole exercise is in the first place. The areas the story has chosen to focus on have been absolutely fantastic, with some of this game's most unique character building that gives Hux a unique identity and sets her apart from DBD's more organic killers. But with every tweak and refinement of Hux's personality comes a pile up of bizarre decisions and stupidity layered on stupidity like a wedding cake that continuously pulls me out of the story to wonder what the fuck the writer was smoking. And that's really annoying, because spending time with Hux as he loves to come to terms with his identity is really fun when it isn't being spent watching the crew of the Toba Landing mission guzzle prit sticks like they're the Hux the Corporation issued ration packs. So in conclusion, was I right when I said that the new tone system would feel more like a half-hearted expansion of the base lore and less of an organic exploration of the character? Well, let's put it this way, I don't think I was entirely wrong. Since the Knight's lore, the tomes have felt like they've been more and more predictable for the most part. I've rarely felt my expectations have properly been subverted in interesting ways. Admittedly, Singularity here is kind of a special case. Because his entire lifespan from creation to abduction by the Entity is documented in detail in the base lore, so there wasn't really a lot for the tome to have room to expand on. And I'll say the trans allegory was a very unexpected turn that took me by surprise in a good way. But a lot of the same flaws that the base story had persisted or even got amplified into this tome. Mostly a weak plot hinging on characters making increasingly bad decisions to get the characters where they're supposed to be. The peaks of Singularity's tome story are undoubtedly the highest of the three killers under the new tome model so far, but it is also the most frustrating to read, as the plot degenerates into increasingly incomprehensible nonsense that struggles to support the weight of this otherwise gripping character study. Look, if these problems aren't a problem for you, you think I'm just being pernickety, then I'm glad this story and Hux's character works for you. It just doesn't completely work for me. I know a lot of people have claimed this chapter is meant to be a parody or satire of sci-fi horror, which would explain the cheesy writing, but if it is, it's a pretty shitty example of it, without the wit needed to make parody or satire actually work. Being self-aware about how crappy and derivative your work is doesn't stop it from being crappy and derivative. Shitting yourself isn't smart, even if you did it deliberately. Besides, Gabriel's tome story should be all the proof you need that end transmission might be self-aware, but it's very far from parody, because that story is pretty fucking serious and explores the horrifying possibilities of the Huxley Corporation's power and control without a shred of irony. We'll talk about that another time. Hux is a frustrating character to talk about for me, because I get the sense there is a general understanding that this law has problems, but there's also a general hostility to actually criticising these problems in good faith. I can think of a few possible reasons for this. You might like the design and unique concept behind Hux, it's totally unlike anything we've seen Dead by so far. You might love sci-fi horror and all the references to it in the chapter, in which case you're probably having a really good year. Or you might just not want Farmer Jones to come back. Surely, comrades, you don't want Jones back. But if there's one thing you should really know by now, it's that I'm not going to moderate my speech because it's unpopular. If I see a problem, I'm going to talk about it. If it doesn't matter to you, then so be it, but it matters to me. That's why I encourage you to read these stories and come to your own conclusions, because we can disagree, and that's okay. After all, we're only human. Well, most of us are. Well, that's everything I have to say about Hux's new tome story. The alien chapter should be landing very, very soon. Are we excited? Do you think it'll overshadow the recent sci-fi horror release in our original chapter lineup? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments and let me know what you think of Hux's story because I'm really interested to see the feedback on this one. While you're here, well, you know the ritual. Do the subscribing, the notification egg, and all the other malarkey. It really would mean a lot. I've got plenty of content lined up for the Alien release that's coming very, very soon, so do keep an eye open for that. And I guess I look forward to seeing you then, so uh, ta-ta for now.